funny about the guy who was uh, looking at the uh, uh, TV and he saw um, a, a report that someone was going the wrong way in the belt line. And he knew his friend was driving on the belt line. So he called him on the phone and said, Hey, Maury, watch out. There's a guy going the wrong way on the belt line. And he said, One guy, there are a whole bunch of them going the wrong way. <laughs> Hi guys, good morning. Good morning. So, uh, put on your seatbelts that we're going to try to talk about all the way to about, I think about 25 minutes. So, we're going to do our very best to get through as much as we can here. Um, obviously, it's a topic that I think about every day. It's uh, clearly the most common arrhythmia that we see in clinical practice, and the incidence is only you know, uh, increasing over time. So, I'm going to try to hit highlights uh, on these various aspects of atrial fibrillation and try to um, focus on things that um, maybe you don't normally hear about uh, from our perspective. So we always need uh, to sort of start an a bit talk with one of these slides because I think we all need to be on the same page that it really is an epidemic. And um, inc incidence is increasing over time. So currently, if we think about 6 million Americans have atrial fibrillation. And um, by the year 2050, there are some estimates that Suggest that it could be even up to 16 million. Are you guys getting funny sound here? I'm trying to separate. Okay. So, a big problem and a growing problem, largely driven by an aging population, but also because there's so many other heart conditions that we're uh, better at treating. And these patients are sticking around and we're giving them time to basically develop atrial fibrillation. It's kind of what we're doing. So, um, when we look at atrial fibrillation, we try to put it into a bucket. Um, these aren't perfect, but the, the point of this is that it helps us sort of tailor a therapy plan based on the type of atrial fibrillation that we have. So, for instance, when a patient is first diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, we don't know where they fall. It could be the first episode, it could be their 20th episode, we just don't know. So we're careful not to label that as anything except newly recognized atrial fibrillation. When it becomes a recurrent problem, that's when we try to uh, put it into one of these buckets, either paroxysmal, which is usually atrial fibrillation that starts and stops on its own um, without intervention, and then persistent, which is atrial fibrillation that tends to need something done to restore sinus rhythm. But obviously, these aren't perfect categories. For instance, if someone who comes in with one day of atrial fibrillation, very symptomatic, it gets cardioverted. According to this, they'd be persistent, but if we had waited maybe two days and they converted on their own, that would be a parox paroxysmal patient. So none of these are perfect, but um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, framework for starting to think about how we're going to treat this patient. And the last thing is this uh, category here, permanent, which is really, um, it's kind of like a joint decision okay, between the physician and the patient that this person's atrial fibrillation is something we're going to accept long term and just use a rate control strategy because efforts at restoring sinus rhythm either haven't worked or they're just not worth the risks involved in the treatments uh, to restore sinus rhythm. Um, but again, a very subjective uh, uh, definition here. So one EP's um, permanent atrial fibrillation is another EP's seven hour ablation you know, targeting every last myocyte in the left atrium. So um, it depends uh, uh, a little bit on um, how aggressive the, the physician is being and also how aggressive the patient wants to be. These are some of the common causes that we know about. This is probably just the tip of the iceberg. It's rare that it's really just one cause. It's almost, a com almost, almost always a combination of several causes. For instance, uh, hypertension, being overweight, uh, advanced age, sleep apnea, diabetes. These things tend to come you know, run together. And so it's typical that a patient will have several risk factors that have, over time, led to atrial fibrillation, because really the common endpoint for 
all of these is changes in the right and left atrium, scarring, stretching, inflammation, abnormal activation, abnormal electrical properties in the left atrium and the right atrium. But it's very important to try to identify the cause because treatment, the foundation of treatment is really treating those underlying risk factors and treating those underlying triggers. Um, because if you don't address those, then anything we do as far as rhythm drugs or ablation really won't make too much of a difference. So we always try to look for these causes and try to reverse them. So I'm going to spend a couple slides on what's act actually happening inside the heart in atrial fibrillation. Now the current model that we uh, use really looks at two aspects. It's the triggers and then the substrate. And the triggers are the initial beats that initiate atrial fibrillation in the heart. And the substrate is then what allows atrial fibrillation to perpetuate. So when it comes to the trigger side of things, it turns out that almost all of the triggers for atrial fibrillation, most patients, actually come from the pulmonary veins. So this is a posterior view of the right and left atrium. So here's four pulmonary veins draining into the back wall of the left atrium. Here is a view of the right atrium with the SVC and the IVC. There was a very important paper that came out in the late 90s that literally uh, took a bunch of patients with atrial fibrillation, put them in the EP lab, put catheters in various places in the heart and just waited for atrial fibrillation to start. And they tracked where the first beat of atria came from. And over 90% of the time, it came from one of these four pulmonary veins. And that's why we're obsessed with the pulmonary veins uh, in electrophysiology, because that's really the, the, uh, the target for us when we think about the ablation strategy. So why should that be? Well, it turns out that there's something very abnormal about this interface between the vein and the left atrium. Here's a CT, uh, 3D rendering of, uh, again, the same view. And if you take a cross-section of a pulmonary vein out here, you might expect that at this point, you're going to see basically vascular endothelium, nothing else. But if you look at the histology, there's actually myocytes even out here, way out here in the pulmonary vein. You think maybe the myocytes would end here, and there'd be a nice interface between that and the vascular endothelium. There's not. There's this um, interdigitation, basically, of myocardial sleeves that extend out into the pulmonary veins. And that transition is very abnormal. Those cells have intrinsic casemaker function. They're very prone to stretching and scar. Um, they're, they have a very different conduction velocity properties, very different refractory periods. And because of that, uh, uh, because of these properties, that's typically where uh, AFib uh, tends to be triggered. And, um, and that's why we, we really you know, focus on pulmonary gains uh, when, we, when we're talking about treating atrial fibrillation. So that's one side of the equation. The other side is the substrate. So once AFib is going, um, this is really where all those other risk factors that cause AFib come to play. So over time, those risk factors are changing the structure of the right and left atrium. They're causing, again, stretching, dilation, inflammation, um, fibrosis. And it allows these micro and macro reentrant circuits to kind of perpetuate. There's also some influence from the autonomic ganglia, which innervate the back wall of the heart. And this is really what allows AFib to then, once started, to kind of continue long term. So, <clears throat> how do we put all this together? So, we think of AFib as a, as a progressive disease. Usually, when patients first present and they have very limited heart disease, we're talking about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And paroxysmal atrial fibrillation tends to be very trigger dependent, very much dependent on those pulmonary veins. Over time, AFib begets AFib, we've all heard that term. AFib becomes more persistent, eventually it's going to become permanent. As that transition occurs, we go from trigger dependent properties to more substrate dependent properties. At this point, treating atrial fibrillation becomes very, very difficult because we're very good at trying to isolate the triggers but we're not so great about trying to figure out what to do about this really diseased, abnormal, irreversible substrate. And this is a, a big reason why uh, patients with atrial fibrillation should really be identified as early as possible and, and uh, sent to us uh, so we can see, if, uh, you know, be it by being aggressive early in the course of their disease, we can reverse things and uh, keep them in normal rhythm. So why do we even care uh, about atrial fibrillation? Because it's true that it's more of a nuisance arrhythmia in and of itself. But the consequences of AFib are actually very important. And they're sort of broken into three categories. We have symptoms, heart failure, and stroke. 
obviously most of these patients come to light because of symptoms. It's true that many patients don't have any symptoms, but it's also true that many patients have symptoms and don't even realize it. So things like effort intolerance or just a little bit of fatigue in someone who doesn't do much, they may not even recognize that that's actually a symptom of atrial fibrillation. The second we restore signs for them, they realize hi, you know, that, that uh, they, they, they could actually feel that good. They just had no idea. Um, so symptoms are on a spectrum. It could be you know, pretty much no symptoms to some mild complications, sometimes just shortness of breath, uh, rarely some dizziness or lightheadedness, syncope, chest pain. You know, in some patients, even two minutes of atrial fibrillation is completely incapacitating to them. So it's a very subjective um, issue. Uh, but we try to gauge how bad their symptoms are to decide how aggressive we should be with treatment. Second thing is heart failure. And this is due to loss of atrial kick. It's due to rapid rates, irregular rates, lack of diastolic filling time. That leads to decreased cardiac output. And then there's a direct toxic effect of rapid rates on the left ventricle. We see reduction in left ventricular ejection fraction. This is a well-described phenomenon, tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. And um, that, of course, drives heart failure symptoms as well. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we have the issue of stroke. Um, this is the thing that we fear the most. Um, this is the thing that we spend 90% of our office visits talking about, um, even though the patients really want to focus on this aspect. Um, it's because the, you know, the consequences are so devastating. Um, stroke uh, is due to impaired blood flow inside the heart, stasis, especially in the left atrial appendage. And um, um, it's, a, it's a big deal. And, and so when we talk about managing AFib, the only mandatory thing about managing AFib is stroke prevention. And then we decide on a rate really control strategy almost as a secondary issue. So as far as stroke risk goes, I think Dr. Kim did a really nice job, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this part. The standard of care these days, the best risk stratification tool we have is a chas vast score. Risk factors are given one or two points, and we add them up, and we decide do patients fall into a low, intermediate, or high risk category. And then these are what the guidelines tell us. It's very easy if the chas vast score is zero or two or higher. If it's zero, we're good with no anticoagulation. It turns out the stroke risk is low enough that really the risk of anticoagulation outweigh its benefits. So that's easy. Okay, chas vast score of two or greater, again, class one indication for oral anticoagulation, either warfarin or one of the NOACs. It's in this category that we have some trouble. And you can see that the guidelines basically support anything you want to do. You can do no anticoagulation, you can do full oral anticoagulation, or you can use aspirin. And the reason for that is that while we give a score of one for being female and also a score of one for being hypertensive, the reality is that we really think of those patients differently. So if you have a 45-year-old female with atrial fibrillation versus a 62-year-old man with hypertension, their chance vast scores are both one, but I don't think anyone seriously thinks their stroke risk is the same. And so because of that, um, because of these nuances, uh, the guidelines allow us to sort of um, individualize treatment. And obviously that man probably you're gonna recommend some anticoagulation for, whereas for the female um, who really has no other comorbidities, you know, you can get away with saying you're, you're fine off of all anticoagulation or maybe just a baby aspirin or something. So um, that is uh, sort of how we make a decision on who to anticoagulate. We know that warfarin has been the standard of care for a long time. Um, so we know it works. There have been several randomized trials uh, looking at warfarin, and we know that if we place a patient on warfarin, we reduce their stroke risk by two thirds, no matter where their stroke risk starts off at baseline. Recently, we have these uh, newer anticoagulants, which are called NOAX uh, for short. Um, I'm going to just summarize quickly. I think I, uh, yeah, Dr. Kim kind of went through this in detail. But basically, all of the new agents are as good, if not better, than warfarin at reducing stroke. And they're as safe, if not safer, than warfarin when it comes to major bleeding. Okay, and I'll just flesh this out just a little bit in this slide here. So the big advantages from my perspective, comparable safety and efficacy. I think the most important thing to know is that they all had less intracranial bleeding compared to warfarin. So you may ask, well, why didn't some of them have equivalent bleeding? Well, it's because their GI bleeding was a little bit higher. But you got to you know, really take that into account. Um, and I tell this to patients. I, you know, I, I say, certainly, uh, we have options between warfarin and one of the new drugs. Um, 
the risk of bleeding is basically the same, but if you're going to have less intracranial bleeding, chances of intracranial bleeding with one of the new drugs, you may have a slightly increased risk of GI bleeding. I think if any of us had a choice between the two types of bleeds, we would all take a GI bleed over an intracranial bleed. And, uh, and I'll tell patients that because you know, I think this is a big point. When we're talking about safety of these drugs, you know, we have to look at not just bleeding, but what type of bleeding, like what's really going to impact this patient's life, you know, versus being possibly just a nuisance wound. So I think that's very important. Um, they all had minimum food and drug interactions. This is a huge advantage compared to warfarin. There's no need for INR monitoring, but there is still a need for some monitoring, as Dr. Kim went over. And this used to be under the disadvantages, but now it's really under the advantages. We have antidotes for dabigatran. We have one that's FDA approved for the factor 10A inhibitors. They're in phase three clinical trials, and it's really just a matter of a year or two at most, I think, before we have antidotes available. Uh, for the other drugs. So that's a, that's a really um, important thing because I think that, that uh, uh, causes a lot of fear for both uh, physicians and for patients. Some of the disadvantages, there's still some drug intolerance. So for instance, with the Vigitran, in the major trial, the discontinuation rate was 21% because of intolerance. Um, they're expensive because they're all brand names still. Obviously, over time, that should change. And importantly, they're not approved for valvular AFib. What's valvular AFib? Finally, the most recent guidelines actually put a definition down, and this is what valvular AFib is. It's atrial fibrillation in the context of either prosthetic heart valves, rheumatic mitral stenosis, or a prior mitral valve repair. If you have AFib in that context, the trials just haven't been done with the new drug, and so warfarin is really the only approved agent. So this is a nice summary of really how I think about which one to choose. Um, the, the, Big, I think the big point is that you really can't go wrong, okay? They're all shown, they've all been shown to be very effective and safe. Um, but if you're going to figure out, you know, uh, try, to, try to decipher which one might be best for a patient, I think this is a nice uh, summary. Um, so just to summarize here, so if, if they have a high, a very high risk of bleeding, I would consider a drug that has the lowest incidence of bleeding. That would be I took this off because it's actually a European approved dose, but we don't have this in the, in the US. Pixaban, very impressive drug. As far as the bleeding numbers, they were just very impressive in the trials. They had, they had lower risk of both intracranial and GI bleeding uh, compared to warfarin. It's really the, um, and the thing that's really impressive about that drug. So anyone with really high risk previous GI bleed, I like a Pixaban. If there are very high risk for stroke, the drug that had the lowest reduction of stroke compared to warfarin in the trials was the big train. If they had a previous stroke and you're looking at secondary prevention, these are the drugs that were studied best for that. If they have coronary disease, rivaroxaban turned out to have a positive effect in the acute coronary syndrome patients. So I like that drug in that situation. Renal impairment, I try to avoid the bigotran. That's the most renally clear. GI upset, turns out the bigotran has the most issues with GI side effects. I try to avoid that drug and use the factor 10A inhibitors instead. And then finally, if patients like the convenience of once, day, once a day formulation, um, Rivaroxaban has that advantage. So this is a, kind of a rough guide, say. Okay, so besides stroke prevention, we have issues of rate control and risk <laughs> control. Turns out not much has changed with uh, rate control. The reason we do it is to improve symptoms and to prevent tachycardia, mediated cardiomyopathy. Our goals are to restore heart rate, an average heart rate of less than 80 if you're symptomatic and less than 110 if you're asymptomatic, and especially if you're older because of the risks of over-exuberant rate control with regards to bradycardia hypotension in the elderly population. So that's kind of the goals. And we do it with our typical drugs, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, uh, digoxin, and then as a uh, last resort for medical therapy and deodorant. And we choose the drug based on the patient's other comorbidities. So obviously in a COPD patient, maybe we'll try to avoid beta blockers, uh, use the other drugs instead. Um, Usually, with this combination, we're successful. Now, sometimes, we're not. Despite being on multiple drugs, patients' heart rates are uncontrolled and they feel miserable. So as a last resort, we have a strategy called ablate and pace. Uh, what we do is we ablate the AV node and cause nitrogenic AV block. Obviously, that makes the pace, patient pacemaker dependent, so we implant the pacemaker at the same time. So we're basically making the ventricles blind to the atrial fibrillation, and then we have full control of their heart rate with the pacemaker. Um, while it's a last resort, because we are making the patient pacemaker dependent, it works wonders in patients who really don't have another option. 
And so this is a strategy we'll, we'll use, and typically it's reserved for older patients. So rhythm control, it's an attempt to restore or maintain sinus rhythm. The most established indication at this time, in 2016, is to improve symptoms and quality of life. You have someone with ACE pit, but symptomatic atrial fibrillation, you should seriously consider a rhythm control approach. But beyond just symptoms and quality of life, I think there's some serious, some, some um, important caveats on other patients we consider rhythm control. Um, for instance, a 35-year-old with atrial fibrillation, kind of hard to commit them to a lifetime of atrial fibrillation, right? I don't think anyone, any of us would want that. Um, and these kinds of patients were not represented in those trials, like the FIRM, and RACE, and AFCHF. Those trials you know, sort of uh, told us that rhythm control versus rate control are basically equivalent. They looked at patients who are between the age of 68 and 72. They looked at patients with follow-up of about two to three years who had other comorbidities as well. You know, the 35-year-old healthy patient with AFib is not represented in that trial. It's hard to tell that patient, you know, whether you're an AFib or sinus rhythm, it's all the same. So if they're, if they're a young patient, if we try rate control and it's just really hard to achieve and we need to figure out a way to restore sinus rhythm, we'll do that. If this is someone's first episode of AFib, I think everyone deserves a chance at normal sinus rhythm, so we will cardiovert or uh, uh, one way or the other, and then see what kind of pattern develops. Uh, obviously, if it was precipitated by, by an acute trigger like hyperthyroidism, we're going to treat the hyperthyroidism, we're going to restore sinus rhythm, we're not going to commit that person to a lifetime of being fit just because they have hyperthyroidism. Uh, tachycardia, immediate cardiomyopathy, another important reason to maintain sinus rhythm, and then certainly patient preference. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that a, a, when I'll just have a discussion about this with patients, and they'll say, so you keep saying normal sinus rhythm. That sounds like a good thing. I think I want normal sinus rhythm. <laughs> I can't argue with that, so you know, we're going to restore sinus rhythm for you. So we do it acutely with either electrical or chemical cardioversion, and then chronically we have the options of either antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. With drugs, we have... Um, Several options, and we choose the drug really based on their comorbidities. And really, the big thing is the presence or absence of structural heart disease, because there are certain antiarrhythmic drugs that have been shown to be dangerous in patients with structural disease, and so our options are more limited in these patients. We also have catheter ablation, and in many patients, that's often first line therapy. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in more detail. But um, that's our basic strategy is either with antiarrhythmic drugs to maintain sinus rhythm or ablation. With ablation, the current indications are for symptomatic atrial fibrillation who, uh, in patients who've tried at least one antiarrhythmic drug and failed. That happens to have a class one indication. That's the strongest of the indications out there. There's a class 2A indication for patients who've not even tried a drug and just want to go with ablation as first line therapy because they don't, uh, yeah, they prefer not to be on a, a, a lifelong antiarrhythmic drug if possible. So even that patient, if they're a good candidate for ablation, there's a strong indication to uh, uh, treat that patient with ablation. As AFib becomes more persistent or long-standing persistent, the success of ablation drops, and therefore the indications are a bit weaker. I happen to think over the next year or two, the indications are going to be stronger across the board as a couple more trials are, are going to be um, published. One of them, for instance, is a Savannah trial which is looking at ablation and medical therapy in a large number of patients, multi-center trial, looking at heart endpoints. So all the trials to date have really shown an improvement with ablation when it comes to symptom reduction um, and quality of life improvement. What we have not seen at this point is whether ablation can reduce heart, out point, heart outcomes of stroke, heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality. And I think all of us believe as our tools are getting better and better and our success rates are improving, that um, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing heart outcomes and improvements with ablation and the medical therapy. So, a couple quick things that you can't get that you can get close to. Another two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, yeah, it's just the last couple slides here. So, um, this is uh, just a couple of slides about what we actually do in the EP lab. Um, when we talk about APO ablation, there's uh, two basic approaches these days. It's either with radio frequency energy or cryothermal energy using a balloon catheter. I'll show that on the next slide. So when we do radiofrequency ablation, what we're doing is um, uh, introducing catheters 
via a femoral vein approach into the right heart, doing a transcephal puncture with these two catheters to introduce them into the left atrium. And we have a roving mapping catheter, which we call a lasso catheter for obvious reasons. And then we have an ablation catheter, which delivers radio frequency current. And the point of this setup is to create an ablation line around the pulmonary veins. There's several ways to do this, but this is just one example of an ablation line that is around the pulmonary veins, essentially building a fence, an electrical fence around the veins to keep all the aphid triggers isolated, either obliterate those triggers or keep them isolated inside the veins, preventing them from getting into the heart and triggering atrial fibrillation. That's the whole point of an ablation procedure. This is what it might look like on fluoroscopy. Cry balloon is a very similar approach. Uh, the advantage is it does uh, uh, only require one transcephal puncture instead of two. We put a sheath across, we have this balloon catheter, and then we have a mapping catheter ahead of it. And the way this works is instead of point by point ablation around the periphery of the vein, this is kind of like a single shot ablation approach. So we inflate the balloon and position it at the osteum of the vein. And we know we're positioned at the osteum through several approaches. Here's one that uses the venogram to show that the pulmonary vein out here is completely opacified. Um, there's no leak of contrast into the heart. And so we know that this balloon is touching every uh, part of the pulmonary vein osteum. And then we freeze the balloon. We freeze it to about negative 35 to negative 55 degrees Celsius. And by doing that, all the heart tissue that touching the balloon will also freeze and we create a line of scar and isolate that vein. We'll do that for each of the four pulmonary veins. So I think, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I was just going to show a case, but I think I'll leave some time here for Thank you. Um, I, all these presenters have great things to say, and I know we have questions. We're going to have a uh, question and answer period for all the people um, at the end. So we'll